Hello and welcome. This mostly educational video is designed to show you how interwar period tank suspension is used, how it works, and the history behind it. Any other effects this video imparts are beyond the liability of Enigma Media. Now, you may be wondering what suspension is, how does it work, and why we even need suspension, and what are a few examples of a practical use case for suspension in tanks. Rest assured, as over this video of an unpredetermined time length, we can answer those questions, and maybe more. However, due to budgetary considerations, and certainly not due to threats of a looming deadline that we are going to blow through, this video will only be covering the more notable types. But it should be noted that there are many more types of suspension, mostly subtypes, do exist. In fact, there are. We, at Enigma Media, hope that you have a memorable experience and maybe attempt to learn something. Without further ado, let's hand it over to me, Enigma, as I explain my current hyperfocus. The start of the interwar period saw tanks that looked like this and this, and it ended with tanks that looked like this and this, marking a pretty serious development in the change of course for the tank design doctrine. In World War I, most, if not all of the tanks that were made were slow and only really designed to be in a breakthrough role. Now, while some people thought the next war would devolve into the same muddy hellscape that the Great War was, I'm looking at you, Tog 1 and 2, and they developed tanks accordingly, the general trend was to smaller, lighter, and faster tanks. To achieve this, they needed to develop more advanced types of suspension from the really rather primitive Great War designs. Today, we're going to look at a few main types of suspension used in this time period. But before we get into that, a brief message from our sponsor, me. Did you know that you can subscribe to me and it doesn't cost a nickel nor a dime? And it would be a great way to help. Did you know that I can also see statistics to work out if you're skipping this bit? So first up, we've got Horstman, which I, for a significant period of my life, called Hortsman. I don't know where that one came from, uh, but uh, let's ignore that. If you'd refer to this drawing, Horstman suspension originally consisted of two wheels mounted on two bell cranks. These cranks connected at a central joint, which allowed them to pivot. The horizontal coil spring bridges the gap in between the two cranks and provides the necessary compression for it to be actually considered suspension. Further iteration of the suspension can be seen on the light tank Mark III and the Universal Carrier, which only featured one bell crank per bogey. The ultimate form of the suspension ditched the large wheels and adopted two smaller wheels on one side, having the larger wheel mounted on the bell crank. It improved overall ride as there were more points of contact with the ground. Later on, the suspension was tweaked back to two wheels total, like the Centurion and Chieftain, but we'll get to that in a later video. Stay tuned. As for examples of the suspension, they put this thing on a hell of a lot of tanks, as it just seemed at the time to be the most efficient and effective, more compact design at the time. And as it was a Vickers development, you can effectively pick any Vickers tank after this thing was first made, and there's a relatively short chance that it'll have Horstman suspension on it. This included the Tank Mark 1A, no, the Light Tank Mark A, no, we'll try that again the light tank mark 1a i got it this time through five there's a whole collection of them the cruiser tank mark one and two and the universal bren carrier but there are also so so many others that use this type of suspension and including the chieftain and centurion but that's a small teaser for a later video so like keep your eyes peeled for a more modern suspension video now, if you watched the World War One suspension video, you would recognize this one. Leaf spring suspension. As we saw in the World War One video, so I'm gonna give you a light refresher. A leaf spring is a type of suspension comprising of layers of a thin metal sandwiched together in an arc-like shape, typically made out of spring steel. When weight is applied on the leaf, it bends, and its force is absorbed through flexural strength, which is just another word that they've made all fancy. It's just bending. And the force is absorbed through flexural stress, 
This involves a combination of tension on one side and compression on the other. While the suspension was generally considered dated, as the leaf spring was one of the oldest types of vehicle suspension even then, it was used because it was cheaper and simpler to make. Because you're not really going around in the interwar period considering it was the depression going hey let's spend a bunch of money on a suspension for a tank. People wouldn't have liked that. Some tanks that used it were the Panzer 1 and 2 with slightly different implementations and the Panzer 35 and 38 and also the Polish TKS series of tankettes. But that's not really an exhaustive list as a whole lot more tanks had the leaf spring style of suspension. They decided to use this because it was a cheap but workable approach. An extremely common approach in this period. Coil suspension is another type of suspension that we saw in the World War 1 video. If you want a more detailed look into coil spring and also leaf spring, I'll have the World War 1 video linked in the description below. But we do need a quick refresher on coil spring. To put it simply, a coil spring is a helical spring that gets compressed when a weight is applied to it. Like the leaf spring suspension, it's another example of simple yet cheap suspension. Developments were made during this period which made the coils more compact, allowing for more road wheels to be added, which improved the overall ride and overall stability. This type of suspension was prolific, nearly every nation having at least multiple examples of it. Some tanks like the Vickers A1E1 Independent and the New Bafazoig. New Bafazoig. I've seen the comments I have received on my creative, yeah, let's call it creative, pronunciation of German words. So. New build vehicle. That's what it is in English, we will use new build vehicle. These tanks use bogey based suspension, which had multiple wheels per spring, which improved weight distribution but reduced individual wheel responsiveness. Other tanks, like the Vickers medium tanks, had an individual spring for each wheel, which helped with smoothing the ride at the cost of, well, just cost. Expensive. It's a lot of springs. So last, but certainly not least, on the list, we have Christie Suspension. And what's sort of been my hyperfocus for a few weeks there, as I was doing research for it. So it's naturally become the headline piece of this video. Christie Suspension was a major development of the interwar period, developed by American race car driver and inventor slash engineer, J. Walter Christie. Christie Suspension worked by having a pivot attached to the hull with a horizontal crank arm and a wheel mounted on the other end. The original version of Christie suspension had a spring mounted on the middle of the arm directly with a vertical spring mounted to the hull, if you'll see here in the drawing, that would compress when load was applied. Later on, this design was adapted to have a bell crank mounted where the spring used to be and the spring relocated and mounted horizontally. This horizontal suspension system allowed for a longer spring and thus a substantial increase in range of motion. However, there is a reason why you don't see Christie suspension that much, as it is extremely unstable. British attempts to use the design tried to mount a shock absorber on the spring. However, that didn't do too great, was dropped in favour of Horstman, Coal Spring, and then later Torsion Spring. The final extra feature of the Christie series suspension was the so-called convertible drive. They let the tank drive without its tracks, as it powered one of its road wheels separate, as you see in the little drawing there. However, in wartime, this wasn't used as it directly traded cross-country performance for pure speed, which wasn't really needed for a tank. As it turns out, in wartime, you also just couldn't just ditch your tracks in the middle of the battlefield, and generally after you took them off, you had to get them stowed on the tank, keeping the extra weight of the tracks with very few benefits. Christie was a rather difficult person to work with, meaning that the US application of the Christie suspension was limited past the initial prototypes that Christie had produced, like the M1921 medium tank. But let's do a quick 
detour to some of the absolutely wild tanks that I found Christy has worked on, as he's done a few, and I really want to know what he was on when he was cooking these up. In no particular order, we shall go over some of the funnier designs I have found. First of all, we have what I have only been seeing called the Christy tag, with a very interesting and what looks to be very cramped design. Then we have the M1919 with an interesting suspension layout with that just sitting there. But next is a much, much less cursed design and the bones of the BT series. It's just, that's just a tank. Yeah, that's what a five year old would draw if you gave asked him to draw a tank. And finally, we have the Christie M1942 light tank. A very pointy and sort of like a cyber truck tank that reminds me of the Soviet BTSV tank. If any of you have any idea what that is, it's on screen now. It's a rather obscure tank. Christie had decided that tanks in an upcoming war would be more used like an armored car used to go behind enemy lines and sabotage the lines of logistics of an enemy. This meant that he prioritized speed over anything else. And it showed. This being another reason why Christie's invention was not picked for US service. It could be penetrated with the smallest of anti-tank rounds, e even infantry anti-tank rifles, and he had the audacity to call it a medium tank. Hi there, uh, post-production Enigma here, and I'm realizing that I forgot to mention the non-Christy applications of the Christy tank suspension. So the Christy suspension was most notably used in the BT-2, BT-5, and BT-7 light tanks in the USSR, and then even later on the T-34. It even saw use in some British vehicles, while it was heavily modified, it did share the same design bones and came from the same roots. Well, it, it, it was a development of Christie's suspension. And then also some Polish tanks like the 10TP, which you'd notice if, you're, if you've got an astute eye. That's what I drew for one of the tank suspension pictures. Thanks for watching my video and listening to my incoherent and honestly wildly unqualified ramblings on interwar tank suspension. By the time this video is out and published, and you've gotten to this point of the video, there should be a poll on my community section about what video I should post next. I also believe that this thing is the longest script I've ever written. But anyways, thanks for watching and make sure to like and subscribe.